want to speak to you about the gathering of the church. Now, I just said to you now that the word ecclesia speaks about a body called together, a body gathering together. So there is kind of tautology in this, uh, in this uh, sermon title. Does anybody know what tautology is about? You, you missed that class in school? Let me help you. <laughs> tautology is basically a grammatical figure of speech and it is the use of uh, two different words, unnecessary and usually unintentionally, because one word would have sufficed. The second word or, the, or even the first one would be superfluous. Great, thanks. And if you, if you did miss that class in school, I'll give you some examples. Um, I'll give you a short summary. <laughs> that was the first example, by the way, <laughs> because the summary is short. It'll only take a brief moment. That was the second example. <laughs> Let me repeat again. Okay, you're getting it because I wanna give this top priority. I feel it's a necessary requirement. Okay, that should be adequate enough. <laughs> now what amazes me is the Holy Spirit does, did not use unintentional but intentional tautology quite often in the New Testament. In fact, there's one place in, in, in the Bible in, in Acts 14 and verse 27 in the English translation, the New King James, there is, I don't know if there is anything like that triple tautology because it says they had come and gathered together the church. So I'm going to speak about the gathering of the gathering because that's what the church is all about. And uh, I, I need to say this, I know it's very logical, but you cannot gather on your own. <laughs> Unless you maybe have overindulged in a meal and you kind of have to gather yourself together <laughs> before they take a group photo of you. <laughs> and, and I want you to listen to, to what I'm saying. Thank God for Christian TV. I'm all for it. But Christian television cannot replace your local church. You need to realize that. Thank God for what we can get on the internet. Uh, I, I heard somebody actually put it this way. This is your electronic fellowship on the web. This is your online church. High-tech church. Well, if that's the church you're going to, I have news for you, you might not know this, but you're part of the geek orthodox. <laughs> and I found this quote, this amazed me because this is an evangelist, this is not a shepherd, a pastor speaking, but this is a British evangelist and he said these wise words, being plugged into a good church is better than listening to a podcast from a great church. Involvement beats eavesdropping. <laughs> That's great. And when you read the Bible, you'll find in the New Testament, quite often the church is described in terms of togetherness. The church is, is, is described as a family, a flock, a, a body, a building, and it speaks about that, that gathering together. I know, I've heard people say this, but I can worship God in my garden. Well, you could, and you should. Now, I know I'm at the risk of giving my age away, but can anybody remember Jim Reeves? Okay, Jim Reeves had a very nice song called My Cathedral, and he kind of spoke about how he appreciated uh, worshiping God in, in, in nature. He spoke about the ceiling being the sky and the hills being the high walls and the, the stream providing the, the music and the flowers were the altar uh, fragrantly giving out incense and 
the grass was the carpet and the, and the uh, uh, trees were the pillars and the stars were the candles. And it's, it's a nice song. But I want to say this to you. Even though you might enjoy nature, that does not replace your gathering with the saints. Even if you have a nice flower garden, you cannot have meaningful fellowship with freesias, fuchsias, frangipanis, and other flowers. <laughs> or <laughs> maybe you have a vegetable patch and you like working in that and enjoying God's creation again, but you cannot have constructive companionship with cabbages, cucumbers, and cauliflowers. You need people. Amen. That's how God designed the church. Amen. Now, here's, here's another uh, way of giving my age away. There was a, uh, a movie called Paint Your Wagon. <laughs> Some of the younger people, you need to go and Google that. <laughs> and this is a very interesting movie and I'll tell you why I, I wanted to speak about it, because there are two songs in the movie. The one is by Lee Marvin called Wandering Star. That's what some Christians are. They're wandering stars. But the, the other one that really struck me was, and you might not believe it, but this song was sung by Clint Eastwood. The only time ever. They never asked him again to sing <laughs> And, and this is a, is a very interesting song because it says the following. It says, I talk to the trees, but they don't listen to me. I could have told you before you started. <laughs> it's great. I enjoy nature. I, am, I become aware of God's presence in nature. But I tell you what, you need people. You need the gathering of the saints. And it's so vital. You can be a soldier without an army, but you will not win many battles. You can be a rugby player or a soccer player without a team, but you will not score many goals or try it. And when I say that you need a church, I'm not referring to the building because the, the building is not the church, but the church is a building. It's a spiritual building. It's a spiritual structure. And um, you are, are God's building. You are God's temple. It's vital to, to see that. The church is not a place, it's a people. Now, I, 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 maybe I'm oversensitive to this, but I, I know that it's been ingrained in us. We will often say to people, welcome in the house of the Lord. That's actually not scripturally correct. We should just leave a, a little word out there and say, welcome house of the Lord. Because you are the house of the Lord. He dwells in you and we, we need each other. And, and this is a beautiful building, but this is not the house of the Lord. You are the house of the Lord. If this was his house, it means we're just visiting him on Sundays during visiting hours. And the baptistry maybe is his bathroom. <laughs> Let me quote another evangelist. Reinhard Bonker says it so clearly. He says, a Christian believer needs a church just as a candle needs a candlestick. I can hear him saying that. A tree needs soil, an electric bulb, light bulb needs a socket. Without a candlestick, a candle cannot stand. Without soil, a tree cannot grow. Without a socket, an electric bulb cannot shine. Neither can you without fellowship. A Christian can neither stand, nor grow, nor shine. Amen. You need the church. Let me give you certain keywords that will help you to understand why we actually gather together as a church like this. And the first keyword is adoration. Adoration. We, it's all about God. He's number one. That's our primary purpose. That's our first ministry. Before we minister to each other, we minister unto the Lord. It's so amazing if you read that scripture in Acts 2 again. Uh, 
that it speaks about the fact that they continue to meet together. That's verses 46 and 47. Every day they met in the temple and in homes, and, the, and it speaks about praising God. Adoration, worship, praise, those things are vital for our gathering. Without that, it becomes meaningless because Jesus should be at the center of everything. Now, incidentally, Jesus is the first one, in fact, the only one in the Gospels that mentioned the word church, because he's the builder, the founder of the church. And he speaks about that in two passages, Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. And in Matthew 18, he mentions these words where two or three are gathered together in my name. And that is a key in his name. Not, that makes our gathering different to anything else. It's all about Jesus. It's not about anybody else. Let me get to the second key word. We gather for adoration, but also for supplication. In adoration, we give worship to God. In supplication, we ask of God. And yesterday's event was mainly focused on supplication, I believe. Asking God and declaring things uh, about our nation. Now, it's vital that we need to realize the power of corporate prayer. Yesterday's event was so significant. If you look at the, the church in the early days, again, the first thing that they do, that they did, immediately after Jesus ascended, it says in Acts 1 and verse 14, that they all met together and they were constantly united in prayer. Wow, that says something about the success of that church. And if we want the same kind of results, then we need to, to follow that. In, um, in Acts 4 and verse 31, it says, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together, there's that phrase again, was shaken. Corporate prayer has shaking power, amen. And that's why I believe yesterday was such an important uh, occasion. In, in Acts 12, we read it again. And over and over in the book of Acts, it says, many were gathered together praying. And that's when God supernaturally released Peter from, from prison. God will do something when we get together to pray. Here's the, the third key word. Harmonization. Harmonization is such a key thing. Unity, agreement with others. Now, we read Matthew 18 earlier where Jesus said, where two or three gather in, in my name, uh, I will be in the, in the midst of them. Here, uh, I, I want to take us back to verse 15 of this passage. And it starts off, and Jesus says this, if your brother sins against you. Now, why does he say brother? Because it's usually the brothers who sin. Come on, ladies, you missed a good opportunity to say amen. <laughs> now, here's something interesting. In the Greek, the word brother, especially when it's used in, in the plural form, has the same meaning as sibling in English. It includes both genders. Okay, so if your brother or sister... <laughs> sins against you. Go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So the whole passage here is about reconciliation, about unity, about dealing with, with unforgiveness, with division, with all of uh, these things, bitterness, etc., etc. But the, the verse that I want to focus on is verse 19. And Jesus says here, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And there's a very, very interesting uh, Greek word that is used there. The, the word for agree is the word symphoneo, where we get our word symphony from. And it literally means uh, making one sound together. And I appreciated your reference to the Philharmonic Orchestra, whoever uh, spoke about that, because Philharmonic literally means philia, me, speaking about love, and harmonica, to love harmony. And that's what the church is about. 
And you here this morning, you are actually God's philharmonic orchestra. You are God's symphony orchestra. And here's the beauty of, of this. Please listen to me. If you've ever been to a philharmonic orchestra or symphony orchestra performance, when they start out, they don't make harmony because right in the beginning, the conductor comes in the old times before all the electronic instruments, he had a, a tuning fork. It was a, a skinny kind of U-shaped um, uh, instrument. They, they, that's what it looked like. So you don't have to go and Google that, young people. <laughs> but that tuning fork gave the note, I think it's the A above middle C, and then all the instruments had to be tuned in on the same uh, frequency. So it helped them because while they're tuning in, it's not a symphony, it's a cacophony. Doesn't sound great. But then when they start playing, they make beautiful, harmonious music. And here's what I thought about. The instruments in a symphony orchestra are so different. Different styles, they make different sound. You have, you have strings, you have um, uh, percussion, you have wind instruments, you have all of these different um, instruments. And they don't even play the same note, but they make harmony. Let me continue. Uh, the next key word, and I think this is an important one, is the word edification. And uh, Corin and I, our ministry is called edify with an I at the end because we realized how important it is for people to be edified or to be built up. Now, I want to read a scripture to you uh, again in, in 1 Corinthians 14 and in verse 26. Now, when I read the scripture, I am convinced that Paul must have been South African. Not only that, I think he must have come from the south of Johannesburg because listen how he starts this verse. Hazard. <laughs> Hazard then, brethren. <laughs> he says... Whenever you come together, there it is again. Each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now the word there in the Greek literally means exactly what the English also says. When we speak about a fancy building, we call it an edifice. It's something that has been constructed beautifully. And so here's what Paul says. We need to make sure that we build others up, that we, uh, we don't break them down, we don't tear them down, but that we, we build them up. And there's uh, an amazing scripture for me in Acts 20 and verse 32, where Paul actually says to the elders of Ephesus, he says, I'm going to commend you to the word of God's grace which is able to build you up. I have been in full-time ministry, and we're so thankful for that for about 42 years. And I'm more passionate about the Word of God than I've ever been in my whole life because I've seen what difference God's Word can make in people's lives. I started with adoration, and I said, in adoration, God is glorified in edification Believers are edified. In evangelizations, sinners are modified and justified. And with all these things, the devil is horrified. <laughs> if we have a proper church service, we will minister to God properly. We'll minister to others in exactly the same way. And I want to conclude with... Uh, with uh, a quote from uh, a man who had a very appropriate name because he speaks about the fact that the church is not just a community club, it's not just a social club or a private members club. And his, his name, as I said, very apt, was William Temple. And he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And this is one of the most potent quotes about the church that I've heard. He said, 
the church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. <laughs> wow. Let me, let me say that again. The church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefits of its non-members. You are here today not just for yourself. You are here for the non-members of this church. You are here for unbelievers, for uninformed. And God wants to touch their lives as well. <laughs> 